So we're, we're getting the slides uh, displayed properly, but the, the problem we wanna focus on is, um, we're, we, we're, many of us use quantum control to, to, to make their devices, to understand what their devices to do, do, to make them do better things. And we see that that control is imperfect. There are other things we want it to do beyond what it does today. And we all know we have to build a lot more qubits than we do today. So we're this is kind of the, the challenge we're looking at. Um, and <clears throat> we have on our panel today, um, four uh, distinguished members. Um, and I will start uh, introducing them. So Mark Schaffman is uh, furthest to my right here. And uh, he is a professor at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, as well as being the uh, chief scientist for quantum information at Colt Quanta. Uh, we also have Dr. Evan Jeffrey, uh, who is a quantum research uh, scientist at Google. Uh, we have uh, Professor Carmen Almodaver, who is at the Technical University of Valencia. And uh, to my right, we have uh, Dr. Jonathan Cohen from Quantum Machines. So the, um, and I, you see we had uh, Professor Chris Monroe was of, of uh, Duke and uh, IonQ was planning to join us, but uh, ultimately he had to withdraw. So um, we, we don't have him, unfortunately, which is a lack in a dimension that may not be immediately obvious in that we had what I thought it was very good coverage, uh, Mark being a, a neutral atoms person, uh, Evan being a superconducting qubits person, and Chris being a uh, ion trap person. Um, so um, we don't have quite the coverage we have. As, as it turns out, my understanding is that Carmen has done uh, used a variety of qubits. So she certainly has some uh, expertise there. So, and what we want, um, yeah. So what we wanna do is um, go ahead and get into the questions. So, okay, well, I'll, I'll just go ahead and read it. And uh, at some point it may come up on the screen here. But so the question is from the control perspective, what are the main challenges in building a useful thousand qubit quantum computer? And uh, Carmen, uh, you being the uh, more the qubit type agnostic person on the panel, I thought I might uh, ask you to start if you would be willing to. Yeah, sure. So first of all, so good afternoon to, uh, to everyone, right? And let me thank the organizers for having invited me to participate in this panel at IGB Quantum Week. Unfortunately, I couldn't make it there in person, right? But I'm glad to participate uh, online. Although it's pretty late for me, right? I will try to not fall asleep. So anyway, so let me let me also mention that my research focuses mostly on quantum computing architectures, or in other words, on the development of what we call the full stack quantum computing systems, right? That consists of a series of hardware and software uh, layers that, that connect quantum algorithm with, with quantum devices, right? Of course, as a part of a part of that of that uh, full stack is the low level what we call low level control systems, right? That that I we did some work on that when I was working at, at QTech in QDelf. But when answering my questions, I will try to answer them from a more from from a more let's say high level perspective, from a software high level perspective, and also system level perspective, like the system as a whole, not only like an isolate isolated layer for controlling the qubits. So. Say that, let me, let me try to answer your first question, what are the challenges, right, for, for building uh, a useful 1,000 qubit quantum computer. So the first challenge, I guess, is, has to do with complexity, right? So we increase the number of qubits, we'll have, of course, more qubits uh, to control, and that changes the, the, the complexity of the problems that we have to, to the complexity that, of the problem that we have to deal with, right? Just to give you an example, for instance, nowadays, for in, in, the, in the software layer, the compilation layer, right? In order to run a quantum algorithm, we have to do a series of optimization and, and, and mapping or, or transpiling processes. And nowadays already with the number of qubits that we have, we cannot use like brute force or exact techniques anymore, but we have to start working with some heuristics. The other challenge is 
about functionality, right? As we add also more keywords to the system, we'll have other requirements in our in our in our systems as a whole, and that requires the uh, to add to the to the the system or a different kind of functionalities. And we have to think also where to locate them, right? If that's something that you put in the, let's say the compiler, you put in this higher level of the stack, or you bring in, let's say, next to, to your quantum processor to the, let's say, quantum control system. And also, I mean, also in, 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 in this complexity, also, I guess that we have also to do with, the, with dealing with errors, right? We already have errors nowadays that we have to, to try to, let's say, to, to mitigate with some, some techniques at different levels of the stack, and that will become worse, I guess, when we put more qubits there. And just one more thing that I forgot to mention, it's about also the constraints of the, of the quantum hard hardware. So as we also increase the number of qubits in, 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 our, in our quantum device, in our quantum processor, I can also imagine that we have to start even uh, using more kind of shared control, and that will also uh, there will also results in, in more constraints that we have to to overcome. That's an important question, Steve, and I think the answer to that question could go in many directions. And while I, I certainly agree with what Carmen said, uh, let me try and offer a slightly different perspective. You know what we do in the what I do in the lab today in my research group at the university what others do, what companies do, which are already hitting scale of 50 to 100 and even a little past 100 qubits, will have to change dramatically as we scale up further. And of course, the number 1000, although large today, you know, in, in five to 10 years time, is gonna be a very small quantum computer because we all know we need much more than that. And it's not going to be extensible or scalable to continue to do things the way we do them now. If controlling every qubit requires a dedicated cable and a digital analog converter and fast waveform generator, you're not gonna be able to have one of those for every single qubit. So what I think about a lot these days is what I like to call multi-scale architectures. We need to come up with approaches where it's like a tree branching out. We may have a thousand or, or many thousands of qubits at the ends of, of the branches on the leaves, but we need you know, groupings of smaller control units that can be multiplexed out to those larger numbers. And exactly how you do that, of course, depends on the physical platform you're working with. Uh, I work with neutral atoms and our control, our wiring is, is beams of light. And so the technical approach to controlling those beams of light is, is very specific and very different than what's used for, for solid state qubits, for example. And so, um, you know, it's multi-scale for me. It's, a, it's an important um, paradigm to think about and to exploit to really scale these things. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, so I, I think actually the, the so I, I, I very much agree uh, with, with, with uh, what Mark said. And, and um, I think one of the most interesting challenges is yeah, when, when we go towards scalability, scale and scalability, which are exact, not exactly the same thing. Um, um, yeah, we want to simplify the system. And we also, we don't want to scale the number of control channels with the number of qubits. Because if you look at a classical computer, that's exactly how classical computers are scalable, right? They, you have a bajillion of, of bits in memory but you also only perform you know, a single operation on 64 bits every, every cycle, every clock cycle of the computer. So that is actually one of the fundamental like, key aspects in classical computers of how you scale up. But then on the other side, uh, on the other hand, we have you know, the challenge with quantum systems that they're just super noisy. So we do want to do things in parallel and we do want to also, it's not just to parallelize, it's also to Put in all these features and functionalities, um, I think, as also Carmen said, into the uh, the control system and into the software that allows us to sort of squeeze the, the the performance from the QPU. So on the one hand, we want scalability to reach you know thousand, ten thousand, I don't know, maybe more qubits. But on the other hand, we are working now with tens of qubits, and we're not really taking advantage of the full you know <laughs> quantum phenomena, even only on twenty qubits. So, so. I think that is the main challenge, um, you know, that 
we have to somehow balance those things. Um, and that, to me, that, that is kind of the main challenge that keeps, and I keep seeing it with people that we work with because they want all these capabilities, you know, feedback capabilities, the ability to shape pulses, the ability to, uh, to, to, to do all this in real time, the ability to, um, to do sophisticated readout techniques and, and on the fly respond um, with changing parameters in the control system and all kinds of features like that on one hand. And on the other hand, we wanna scale up and simplify the system. So this is to me the main challenge that we have to solve some of squeezed performance from the QBU, but then rich scalability. So these are kind of slightly opposing forces. Uh, I guess I would say, um... Uh, thanks. Thanks for inviting me, first of all. Um, and to me, the, the biggest challenge of making a the control system for a useful thousand qubit quantum computer is that not only do we not have a useful thousand qubit quantum computer to build it for, but I would very strongly argue we don't even have close to one tenth of that. Like our 50 to 100 qubit systems right now are... Uh, they have several, you know, I, I would say each platform can speak for themselves, but uh, uh, they all have problems. If if there was a prop platform with no problems, I think we'd all agree on it. Um, and so we're not exactly sure what the thousand qubit, I, I mean, maybe we could make a thousand qubit of our current system, but it would not be uh, useful and it would not be extending the state of the art. So. Right now, when we do uh, our experiments at Google, and I think a lot of other places are like this, they do, we, we pull every trick in the book to get this, the level of performance, the maximum like little last drop of performance out of the qubit uh, chip, and it's still not enough. Um, you know, ion traps are blessed with, uh, I'll, I'll say that for uh, Chris, who's not, not here, um, you know, great, great intrinsic decoherence in some ways, but it, it has other issues. Um, uh, I haven't followed as much of the neutral atom stuff recently, so look forward to hearing about that. But um, we know we're gonna have to optimize this system, but we sort of don't know which axes we're going to be able to relax our constraints on. Um, so from a signal processing perspective, for instance, right now we do, not only do we have individual control on every single line, but we have uh, reflection correction, uh, crosstalk correction, settling time correction on every every possible pair of channels. Um, it's a sparse matrix, but we we calibrate it for everything. Um, it's very hard to figure out how you make that into a general purpose or into a more scalable system, as people have talked about. Um, uh, this is an area where I think probably neutral atoms uh, using using light beams probably have some advantages with uh, the ability to use spatial light modulators is my guess. But uh, uh, that kind of thing is very difficult to imagine how to make um, scalable in the way that uh, Yonatan talked about. So knowing what our target is uh in some sense to me is the biggest uh biggest constraint and until we know that it seems like we have to plan for everything and then it's not going to be the system that we want okay maybe we can get to a thousand qubits like that but uh i think everyone agrees ten thousand qubits with the completely general system is uh is maybe if it's not infeasible, it's impractical. Let me add a comment on top of what Jeffrey just said. You know, I think one of the challenges in scaling is not just the increased amount of hardware that you need that grows with the number of qubits, but there's really a, a calibration and a data management challenge because as we just heard, um, every single qubit has to be calibrated in terms of reflections and crosstalk and just taking the crosstalk issue for a moment that can scale super linearly with the number of qubits in the system, depending on the range of crosstalk that actually occurs on the hardware. And so there's a very big challenge in uh, learning how to be maximally efficient about calibrating and tuning up a system 
and tracking all that information. You know, do you tune up your system, use it, and then over some time scale, which is very platform dependent, the system will get out of tune and, and have worse performance. Do you wait until it gets very bad and then tune it up again? Do you constantly interleave a little bit of tuning with a little bit of useful computation all the time? What's the best way to do that? There's some very interesting questions in terms of optimal control, not just of the qubits as a computational fabric, but as of the whole system to keep it optimally working well. And it's an interesting problem, but also a very challenging one. Yeah. Um, I'm actually very happy that everyone kind of agrees on, on, on this. So I, let, let me maybe even ask maybe a sort of, I know that you're on the moderator and you're asking questions, but <laughs> maybe if I can ask the panel a, a question, I mean, so what, so if that's the case, it, it seems to me that sometimes we're not talking about this elephant in the room, right? That like, so I, I think Evan, you said it right. Like, why are we continuously defining the goal as creating, you know, a 10,000 qubit computer and not saying the goal should be, let's make a hundred qubit computer first. That is just really hundred qubits that we can use. Like if this is the bottleneck, why aren't we putting our emphasis there? Or I mean, we are, but why, you know, we go all these, all these conferences and everybody's talking about thousands, thousands of qubits and right. Um, why so maybe it's kind of pulling us is it pulling us from the, the actual goal okay I, so i mean first of all i'll say i 100 percent agree and i internally and externally every time i get the chance say we need uh the thing we need most is better qubits not more qubits and better in a lot of axes but there's a lot of things that also need to happen in the like system design of a thousand qubit processor. For instance, in, in superconducting uh, qubits, somewhere be, somewhere around a thousand qubits is sort of the maximum number that you can imagine putting on a single reticle with current device designs. So when you say I'm gonna make a thousand or 10,000 qubits, you're saying I'm gonna solve the problem how to connect multiple chips together. And that's a real problem that has to be solved in addition to coherence, fidelity, control systems, scalability, wiring. So there, there's a lot of other degrees of freedom that are part of those roadmaps. But I, I absolutely agree, better qubits is something we need. So he, hearing the, uh, the conversation kind of die off, we'll go to our second question. So in order to tackle these challenges, what kind of control architecture redesign can we foresee in the next three to five years? Go ahead, Carmen. Okay, can you hear me? Okay, good. So so let me let me first make a comment about this still the previous question where you are saying, okay, so we are maybe we are focusing, as Jonathan mentioned, so much in building this 1,000 or 1 million uh, um, quantum computer, right? But why not to be like a very good 100 computer? Indeed, as I completely agree that we have to also to focus on, on improve the technology right from quantum power up to down, uh, up and down of this, this stack. But still, that doesn't prevent us to, to, to start looking at, at what if, right? Because we cannot wait till that 100 perfect computer wars to, to start thinking about, about how we are going to scale to 1,001 million qubits, right? So a completely different approach indeed. And that's something that, for example, we, we uh, Mr. Lewin with, with QTEC at UDELF is like, what if we build a 1,000, 1000 a crossbar of spin qubits or quantum dot array, right? And try to investigate and, and start to investigate in what are the main bottlenecks there, right? What are the things that don't work? What are the things that, that, that still might work? This, this kind of, of questions, right? So uh, say that, and, and coming back to, to your question, so that was like, what are the, the redesign right that we foresee in the three, five, three, three, five years to, to uh, overcome these challenges, right? So the first thing that we have to do is like, so far we have been developing, like say like ad hoc, or like we have been designing things like a kind of artisan way and not exactly like that, right? You, you, don't get me wrong, but the first thing that like, we have to to change this, the the way that we design things, we have to go from a more as I say like a thought design to a more like a structured design, and in the long term to the development of these automatic EDA tools or or whatever you want to call it, or, or this kind of tool that we're using in classical computer, right? 
also related to that and, and how we design things. I think that co-design and cross-layer co-design, you, you heard, uh, if you attended the the talk from from Frechon, Combonde, I had I, I guess that he he mentioned those terms, right? That co-design is crucial for developing like quantum computer systems nowadays, right? To squeeze and extract the most of of resource constraint and, and noisy quantum devices. But I think that co-design will be still also important and, and crucial in the development of, of large scale or, or one thousand qubit devices. The only thing, so what else we can do? Like, I guess that we have to go, let's say, from a more centralized approach that we are using nowadays to uh, distribute it on the baby controller, right? Kind of great of, of networking with different uh, elements uh, communicate like line of, 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 of in the internet. And the other thing that was mentioned uh, already, like, it's maybe it's not crazy, and actually, I mean, it's in a roadmap of, of, of companies like IBM, right? Is to go from this single core approach in which we try to put more and more qubits in a, in a single device, right? To I like to call it to a multi core or many core approach in which we have different processors that are connected first via, for instance, just classical communication links. And in the long run, in the long future, right, with this also like, like, like quantum communication uh, links and in that kind of, of network in, of, of, of quantum intranet or interconnecting network. So yeah, those are the, the main changes or the main, the main things that I think that we, we have to, to do in order to, to go to 1,000 or even larger quantum computer devices. Um. Before um, touching on how our approaches have to change in the future, let me just go back to this question of, well, do we even care about a thousand qubits right now? Shouldn't we just focus on making one or two really good qubits and showing that we can control them at the level we need to scale up? I mean, in my uh, university lab, we've already demonstrated atom arrays with over a thousand atoms. And, and that's wonderful. And they're very small arrays and they have a, a very small footprint that would even let us imagine going up to a million or more. But um, you know, friends will tell me, well, I don't care about that. You couldn't control them well enough to actually use that thousand qubits. And that's certainly true. And so why don't you just focus on you know, two really good ones and then scale up? And you know, there, there's multiple paths that could be envisioned to get to this ultimate uh, useful goal. You could uh, make a lot of qubits and then work on making them better, or you could start with two, make them very good, and then scale up. And some people think uh, one approach is the only way to do it, and others think it's the other approach. Um, you know, I don't think there's a correct answer to that question. You could make two very good, very controllable, high fidelity qubits, but if you did that in a way that does not intrinsically scale, that's not going to get you there either. Uh, we can make our gate operations higher fidelity working in neutral atoms by making some choices that don't scale. Uh, the choices we make to scale up make it harder to get high fidelity. And so you, you really, of course, need both. And so that, that's, that's the challenge in the community. Um, a comment about things that have to change and let me focus specifically on neutral atoms that I work with. So as I said, we use beams of light. That's our wiring to control the qubits. And there's different devices that can be used. The device that's projecting uh, this session up on the screen or the devices in your laptop screens, they have millions of pixels, millions of degrees of freedom. And so, okay, I got a million pixels. If I had one pixel per, per atomic qubit, I could control a million qubits. That's wonderful. Except those devices operate at video frame rates, 60 hertz or 50 hertz. So that's no good. It's way too slow. We use today other devices that are very fast that work at uh, megahertz rates at sub microsecond switching speeds, but they don't have a million degrees of freedom. So this goes back to multi-scale. We need to come up with ways of uh, integrating, uh, combining the uh, many degrees of freedom of these slow devices with the smaller number of degrees of freedom of these very fast devices. And we have some new ideas about that. I, I can't talk about it today, but th these are things we're actively uh, working on. I was wondering, by the way, uh, so yeah, in superconducting qubits, yeah, beyond certain number of qubits, you, you'd want to start connecting chips together. Is there similar concepts? Um, maybe you cannot talk about it, but uh, in the in the in like neutral atoms, basically creating a couple of 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 of, of, of tweezer arrays and then having them communicate. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, Chris is not here and I can't really speak for him, but of course, one of the known 
uh, architectures for scaling trapped ion systems is optical interconnects. And, and Chris was one of the pioneers of that architecture for the, for the trapped ions. And we think about similar things with neutral atoms, uh, performing atom photon entanglement, and then creating remote entanglement between modules and scaling up the system in that way. I think the reality is that the networking performance uh, that one would need to realistically scale to large quantum computers is just not there today. That's, I mean, the uh, state of the art in remote entanglement, at least with neutral atom qubits and also with trapped ions is uh, entanglement rates that could be, you know, not more than a hundred or so with fidelities and not higher than the mid nineties. So there's, there's a long way for that uh, remote entanglement technology to go before this really uh, becomes practical, but that may ultimately uh, be very important. So to me, to me, I mean, from the control electronics pr perspective, um, one of the things that I think are, is going to be important is um, how we integrate classical processing into the uh, the heart of the quantum control system, like, um, in a way that, again, allows us to squeeze the the QPUs for for the performance, but at the same time is 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 pulling towards scalable solutions. Um, um, and that I think, you know, so when I say integrating classical processing into the control system, I'm talking about things like active feedback, um, where we, whether it's in order to do fast calibrations or even embedded calibrations, things that allow you to, um, to then perform calibrations much, much more frequently, maybe even in an embedded uh, manner inside your sequences, which actually can reduce some of the main uh, error uh, sources, at least in some of the the, the, the qubit uh, modalities. Um, but then this this costs this costs in 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 you know classical computation power. So how did you distribute this classical computation power uh, across a system of you know thousand control channels or more? And if we talk about quantum error correction, then again there is this this issue. Okay, we need to track the error. So again, we need classical processing power. How do we distribute this classical processing power? Is it just a global error decoder or do we have local error decoders that then um, reduce the overhead that we have um, on, the, uh, on the global error decoder? So there is a lot of uh, interesting games that you can play with architecture of how you distribute classical processing um, and what is the fundamental architecture of your classical processors that are embedded into the control system. Um, and I think um, that's going to be very important as we as we scale up, because I don't think that we can get rid of it. I don't think that we can um, get rid of all of these um, heavy machinery that, as, as Evan said, we need to play all the tricks in the book to, to kind of uh, optimize fidelities and not do it once every 24 hours, maybe do it once every millisecond. Uh, so we need this classical power and we need to be close to the qubits um, and then we need to do state preparation, which also requires active feedback. So all of these things, we have to play all these tricks. We won't get rid of them in the near future because we're not having good enough qubits. Um, but then, okay, so either we just pay tons of, you know, either the control system is just super expensive, which okay, it's good for quantum machines, but um, <laughs> but of course, <laughs> of course, we 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 do need to. To find scalable solution and reduce the price per qubit control. Uh, in fact, that that is a part of our vision. So, so how do we do that while we did we do need to play all the tricks in the book? So it's 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 it's, it's a challenge, and it's it comes down to architecture, um, and uh, looking into the uh, to the use cases very carefully, and kind of nailing down what it is that we're giving up on and what it is that we're keeping in the system that's i think the the most interesting problem to solve so, yeah so uh i would say one of the most maybe to look at this retrospectively one of the most interesting things that's happened in the past few years is the the software architecture that uh, we and i'm sure other people have have developed in order to manage groups of dozens of qubits. Um, and uh, so everyone's covered all the stuff about like um, 
just the fact that it's a complicated function you're calibrating. You can have functions between all the control lines, but um, just sort of managing the the state of all of those qubits. So I'll, I'll give an example of how this works. Is we have uh, if we have a qubit a chip with 72 qubits, um, we can operate that chip in many different configurations. We have single qubit configurations. We have uh, single qubit parallel configurations where we can control each qubit independently, um, but we don't have any multi-qubit interactions. We have different what we call grid configurations where we have couplers between all the qubits. Um, and we do calibrations in sort of all of these different configurations and, and baseline calibrations like a Pi pulse are sort of subtly different in each one of these variations. So uh, right now that's something that is all done in software. Uh, and it's been a really like interesting development effort to figure out how to um, manage all these configurations, figure out what, what is uh still valid what's obsolete and and update them um that is something i could foresee in developing these uh new um uh, uh sort of hardware calibrations that uh, uh jonathan had, had alluded to um figuring out how to get what what parts of that system can be encoded into your hardware or low level software design or where, what doesn't make sense to do. Uh, I think that's something that's really interesting and is going to happen. And it's going to be a very, uh, uh, well, so far all of this has been done for calibration and so-called NISC algorithms, but figuring out how to start to um, bring that together with quantum error correction uh, as we reach device sizes where doing quantum error correction makes uh, sense, uh, even if it's not particularly useful yet. Um, I think that's going to be really interesting, figuring out how to to handle this sort of configurational complexity. I have a follow-up question on a couple of us mentioned um, multi-chip, or maybe I should say multi um, atomic unit um configurations as we go forward in time here does that does that imply that there is a new role for quantum uh control between chips not just from the outside world to the single quantum chip but from quantum chip one to quantum chip seven and has anybody thought about that any any ideas um we, we've thought about that a, a fair bit. Um, I also don't know, Carmen sounded like she might have some things that really um, are more relevant for that. Uh, but a lot of it depends on whether you're doing error correction or uh, anything else. For error correction and um, particularly the surface code, we sort of think about uh, eventually making a grid or at most like, a two-layer, a bilayer grid, so 2.5 dimensions, um, and there, yeah, we'll need chip-to-chip -chip interconnect, but it's still still local, uh, not not arbitrary interconnect. Um, for quantum communication and NISC applications, uh, I hope someone else can speak on that, but I think there they're more interested in more exotic interconnects. And we are also looking at this, as I said, this multi-core approach that you just mentioned, right? And just putting several chips together and just connect them just with classical communications or with uh, in, in the long term, right? With also with, with quantum communications. But as it was mentioned before, right? We are still far from that, although there are a lot of uh, uh, progress also in the field of, of, of quantum, uh, of developing uh, quantum coherent links, right? In order to Teleport states and all these things, right? We're still we are still not there. We have to wait a couple of years. But 
one of the of the, of the ideas that 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 the community is looking at now is this idea of using like connect to connect several NIST processors, right? Just with classical communication. So by doing so, we will be in principle able to run the larger quantum algorithms in terms of number of qubits, right? In this in this device, but for that we will need to use because we will have let's say a, a coherent quantum information right across chips right, and but for that we will need to develop a as, as you may hear of a circuit cutting and niching techniques that we don't know yet if that will pay off because there will be some bottlenecks there not only the cutting part let's say how you cut the algorithm because you cut it let's say in wires right and how to distribute it in the course but also how you reconstruct the 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 the, um, the output distribution right in the in the parts of the niching and in that sense they will need there will be also need some classical communications across the the chips and also with this classical communication not only for synchronization and so on but also can let's say reduce the amount of information that is is needed for the for the niching and then if we go one step further, the next step indeed will be in the long run to go from this uh, quantum intranet, if you want to call it, if it's across reaches or within the same chip, depends on the scale, right? But we will need to incorporate not only classical communications for synchronization and for, a, a, let's say, teleporting or, or whatever method you use for, for for transferring the information, the quantum information from one chip to another. So we will need this classical communication, as I mentioned, and of course, the quantum link. And of course, classical processors and quantum processors. So at the end, what we will need is like, again, classical processors working together with quantum processor, together with classical communication, together with quantum coherent communication. So that, and of course, that will change the, the way in which, in which, let's say, we, we we develop the uh, our system, right? That will uh, that will change the, the the that will will require a complete rethink of the of the system design. All right, moving on to question three. Uh, we actually several of us have already touched on this, but how much should the industry focus on building a controller supporting a thousand plus qubits uh, versus other aspects that may increase the number of useful qubits in today's more modest, effective QPUs? So. And I'm I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna push us a little bit. I'm I'm gonna ask you to quantify. So it says how much. So this is kind of a thing should should sum to one. And you know if you had a dollar to spend, how many dimes would you spend on um, on one versus the other? It, it's it's very easy for us not to be specific because when we're specific, we know that somebody might hold us to it. But um, I, I, I'm going to I'm going to ask us to uh, be a little more be, be a more specific than we might be completely comfortable. So, so Steve, your question is how much should we focus on the control hardware versus other aspects? No, no, no. Sorry. So the question is how much uh, thinking of the controller, how much should we focus on supporting a thousand qubits? And how much should we focus on enabling better qubits? Actually, I actually think that this is a, this is an amazing uh, uh, question. The, the the fact that you make us uh, quantify it because um, actually, when I saw these questions, I wrote to myself before the panel a similar question, a similar answer to to what Carmen said before. That I mean, we need to do both, right? We because you know, we need to get. We need to get ready for the day that we are going to get, you know, great qubits, and then of course we want to do scale up, massive scale up. But now, if you, if you, if I have to choose, or at least you know, wait, put some weights, uh, I, I would put seventy percent on on. Uh, I think on on making better qubits, but 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 as Mark said, like. It, very carefully in a way that those you know 20 30 whatever number of qubits that we decided we go for um uh, to demonstrate that you know that we take full advantage of this 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 small scale qpu but being careful in that this is done in a scalable way so i would put the emphasis there so doing something at like i would put 70 percent of the of the effort on doing something that demonstrating some i don't know a few tens of qubits very very good uh full quantum computer 
um, but uh, scalable architecture, control, qubit, everything. Yeah, I would say that I would put relatively little emphasis on actually providing today a, a thousand channel or thousand qubit controller. That, that's not um, where our immediate challenges are. And in fact, the control hardware we have available from quantum machines, and we work with many, many vendors, both at Cold Quanta and at the university who provide different parts of our entire control system. You know, we have excellent electronic sources today that produce very low noise, very highly controllable, uh, pure frequency signals that we can use to control our qubits. That's not the limitation. What would enable faster progress is the combination of the um, electronic control hardware and the software and researcher interface that was more flexible and more friendly and enabled faster exploration of different solutions. I think that's what's holding us back more than the intrinsic quality of the hardware. Other parts of the hardware we have um, work to do. Our lasers are better than they used to be, but they still need to be somewhat better. That's a, it's not quantum machines job, it's, it's other companies and including Gold Quanta. But um, you know, enhancing the usability and the flexibility and um, just the, the range of different configurations that can be rapidly explored, that, that would be very helpful. Well, maybe, um, I don't know, buck the trend a little bit, uh, which is, it, depending on how you count, I think the electronics that are available right now are, uh, well, in, in some sense, they're, they're far more capable than I hope we need in the long run. That's this idea of making a sim system that we can simplify to scale up. Um, so to me, I, I'm not sure I see them as two different aspects. Uh, I want to scale up the control systems to larger systems to solve the the problems that need solving from the control systems perspective. Um, I'm not sure, like, the control systems really have a huge role to play and say, I mean, I mean, for us, we're concerned about coherence. That's the that's the number one bugaboo in uh, the superconducting qubit world. So um, I don't think the the control electronics have a whole lot to say about that right now. Like the the noise and phase noise and drift and so forth. Uh, there's a few issues there that we have to watch out for, particularly with drift. But it's uh, it's not that big a deal. Like the the way I like to put this is the cheapest, nastiest microwave synthesizer that you can buy off of AliExpress is better than the best superconducting qubit in the world. Uh, so there's, um, to me, the, the a lot of the interesting problems and important problems in the control systems come with scaling it up, um, at least from the perspective of superconducting qubits. Uh, so that, to me, I, I would put a fair amount, uh, I don't know, 60, 70% on that. And, um, but I think that includes a lot of things about maintaining the performance, maintaining what I talked about of being able to uh, allow the experimenter to address different configurations of multi-qubit processors. Like, I would like just to, to emphasize what you were just said, right? That indeed it's not only about making better qubits, right? That that's of course required. It's about getting better performance for the whole system, right? And that that includes all, all the all the functional layers from 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 uh, bottom to 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 the top. And if I have to choose, I mean, I have to to quantify that. I I, I yeah, I, I agree that these two aspects or path they are intertwined, right? You cannot. So just if you ask me to quantify that, if I'm very conservative, I would say 50-50, right? Just, just both things in parallel, and they are kind of growing organically together, right? So yeah, it's what it was already said. So maybe I'll uh, 
interject a, a question from the chat here from Nicholas T. The US recently passed the CHIPS Act to promote local semiconductor manufacture. Are the quantum computing platforms of today ready to take advantage of this opportunity or do we further need to improve hardware stacks before scaling up manufacture? Uh, I can tell you our program managers were very excited when the CHIPS Act pack passed, but I, uh, I am not the person to ask about what the actual impact on us, our supply chain and our development would be at this point. Perhaps I'm repeating myself, but I'll say particularly for atomic based qubits, be they trapped ions or neutral atoms, you know, I think a lot of our challenges as we look towards scaling to a thousand and beyond are, are not in electronics, it's in the optical technologies, you know, it's and hopefully the CHIPS Act will also support R&D in that area, but it's, you cannot buy today the kind of light control devices that we really need to scale up. And so there, there's R&D that has to be done to make that technology available. And, you know, quantum is one of the markets that hopefully will encourage that investment. So I think what I'm hearing so far is scaling up what we're doing today would not particularly be high value. We don't have great qubits today. We don't have great numbers of them. The, the chips that we can build, sorry, the, the quantum processors we can build are not useful enough that having a million or a billion of them out there would be valuable to society. I, I think that's a safe statement. Okay, let's uh, go ahead to question four. Uh, what controller metrics will be most critical for quantum controllers in the next three to five years and why? One of the aspects that we haven't talked about uh, is of course, error correction. I, I went to a lot of talks um, earlier today about uh, quantum error correction and decoders and so on. And uh, that of course adds another dimension to the requirements on the control system which is real-time decision-making and branching, which um, you know, implies a very tight integration of classical computation uh, on quantum data to uh, uh, make the, the quantum machine uh, reliable and error resistant. So you know, that, that's one aspect, bringing in more computational firepower closer to the qubits in a way that, that can operate very rapidly in a real-time fashion. Yeah, I fully agree with that. Um, well, clearly, because this is a lot of what we're doing at Quantum Machines, it's about that. Um, uh, and I think that this is important when we talk about metrics, like what do we measure in terms of the control system? Because yes, we can measure the jitter, or the phase noise of the lines. We can measure, you know, a lot of a lot of different uh, performance metrics. Uh, but um, but I think that you first need to kind of define what before you can you know define a measurement of how how well your control system is 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 is, is uh, performing uh we should define what it is that the control system should be able to do um so actually we are doing a lot of work on thinking about these kind of benchmarks for real-time uh classical computation real-time feedback um whether it's for error uh correction whether it's for uh, adaptive measurements uh, that you would embed then later on in, in, in error correction or, or other um, cl classical processing that has to be done in real time um, and the latencies that you need in order for uh, in order for this classical processing to actually do what it needs to do um, and improve performance. Um, so to me, uh, there are things like adaptive measurements where you would measure qubits while the circuit is, is running, and then you either branch or play conditional pulses. And in both of these cases, you need to define what are the, or measure what are the uh, required latencies. Um, and then there are things like uh, near time uh, classical computation, uh, where you not necessarily that have to do the classical processing in, you know, while the, the circuit is running, but you do want it to be very fast in order to again do these calibrations very fast or very often so that you could every time you run a shot of your uh, quantum algorithm it actually performs with the best performance because you run a 
fast calibration just before that. Um, so that is again requires to do some uh, control sequences on the qubits and then measure them and then do some classical processing and then uh, correct some parameters. Um, so again, we would measure the latency. So in all of these classical processing, it's about what kind of process processing I, I can do on the on the qubit measurements um, and how fast can I do it and what's the feedback latency. So I think that's going to be important. Maybe I could just add a little more to that, you know, beyond integrating the computational capability with the control system, there's also the software question. And a lot of what we've we put a lot of effort at Cold Quanta into building up the software side of things and not just software, but making it intelligent. And so we're now at the point where we can, when we want to tune up the machine, we can press a button from a cold start and it will go through a sequence of tuning operations to bring all the operations up to spec. And that's, I wouldn't say it's hundred percent reliable yet, but that's work in progress. But where we ultimately want to be is that we have an intelligent control system for the quantum computer. So it's not the user or the, the operator who says, oh, it's time to recalibrate now, but the machine is constantly analyzing itself, evaluating the performance and deciding itself, now is the time when I have to go back and do some calibration routines, do some tuning uh, before I can run more computational jobs. So, you know, call it AI, call it machine learning, whatever, building that intelligence, that autonomy into the system as we scale is gonna be incredibly uh, important and required. So, so indeed from a control system, which will be all right. So one of the main, the, 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 the metrics that we can, we can foresee there are the latencies, the power, right? The performance, the throughput, the execution time and, and so on. But I think what it's more, more important is not only to define these metrics that are only related to the control system, which is also very relevant, right? But also to combine the different metrics of the different, let's say, functional units, to combine metrics from hardware level, from control system level, from software level, and just to group them, and let's say, in kind of field of major cost function, right? That is like an overall system performance matrix. I think that we have to, to keep that in mind, right? That at the end, what we need is like to, 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 to measure the performance of the system as a whole, right? And that includes, of course, the metrics or a combination of the metrics of the different layers, such as the, the, the control part. And something that was already uh, mentioned by Jonathan, I think, is like, we talk about metrics, but metrics are related to benchmarks, right? And benchmarks is what kind of applications or what kind of workloads we are going to run in order to, to measure those metrics or to get those metrics, right? And, and, and th those benchmarks should be, let's say, complete in the sense that they represent, I mean, that they, there's a, a variety of, of, of uh, applications or algorithms that represent the kind of workloads or, or uh, applications that we will have in, 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 in real. Uh, real life, right? So, yeah, I think that those are the, the, the most important aspects in terms of, of metrics. I guess I, I um, you know, following on to what I said about the, uh, should we make a thousand uh, cubic controller? Um, I'd, uh, I I at least want to start uh, thinking and getting some, some better ideas about, um, like size, power, size and power, and, and maybe secondarily cost, um, because I, I really want to, you know, implement. Uh, I, I want our quantum systems to be to implement this sort of sublinear scalability, or or at least, uh, let's say, moderately heavy multiplexing, but. I think the controller system for a useful fault tolerant quantum computer is going to be pretty big and um you know in the next three to five years probably will still be fine but uh eventually it's just going to be hard if the control system is the size of a room and you're talking about microwave signals getting them down to a single chip is is pretty difficult so i i do want to think about uh you know cost size weight and power when it comes to thinking about how we're going to get to the fault tolerant point. Um, I don't know the trade off to make between how much do you do that when the architectures are still up in the air, but uh, uh, I think it's it's an important access to to improve on. Well, thank you. Um, 
moving on to the next one. Um, so this is a, another one that kind of uh, puts each of us on the spot here. So considering that the best qubit is the one you're of course working on, what would you say is the second most promising <laughs> qubit type? Is pros and cons and how you see it impacting the control layer? Uh, well, this is an easy one for me. Uh, I uh, it's not represented here, but by far my uh, if 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 Google doesn't make the first scalable quantum computer, I really hope that it's optical. Uh, it's maybe an outside choice. I think less less out there than it was five years ago, but um, still pretty out there. Uh, the thing that so I'm. Uh, I remember at a conference when I was a grad student doing optics, uh, someone put up a photo of the polarization of the cosmic microwave background and said, there's still polarization of the electric field left over from the Big Bang. Uh, so coherence is not a problem for, for optical photons. Uh, I think that was a bit of a, a grand overstatement, uh, but the biggest advantage it has by far is coherence. Um, depending on how you encode your qubits. Um, and it's also very nice in that uh, you have that level of coherence while the qubit excitation energy is much higher than room temperature. Uh, so all of the, the current linear optic systems run at uh, three or four Kelvin, but they do that so that the detectors can work um, which is a, a pretty well understood thing. Uh, the, uh, but the photons themselves, um, there's, there are some noise issues with uh, thermal noise issues. So they don't, they're not upset that they have to run at three Kelvin, but uh, uh, I think that's a pretty big advantage uh, that it's a sort of chip integrated device that can run at three Kelvin and has good coherence. My answer would be the same as Evans, but for a different reason. I don't personally believe in a large scale optical quantum computer. I, I'm not on that bandwagon. That said, I do believe that the technologies that are being developed uh, in support of trying to achieve that are going to be very valuable for what, what we do with neutral atoms. Uh, so I think Psyquantum and Xanadu and others are developing fantastic technology in integrated optics, integrated photonics. I, I don't believe that's a path to scalable quantum computing, but it's a technology that will enable a lot of things we want to do with atomic systems. And if you talk about networking, well, we have to connect atoms with photons, and so we, we need integrated optics. And um, you know, atomic qubits are, are really ideal for connecting the photons because photons are what we use to control them anyway. So we have a natural interface that's already there, whereas connecting solid state systems to photons is generally much more difficult. And I think, you know, also one of the application areas and uh, value generators of these quantum systems is not just in large scale computing, but also, um, out of the edge, you know, together with sensors and distributed systems, distributed computation. And so making that possible will require lots and lots of optical technology, compact, reliable, uh, robust, repeatably manufacturable uh, technology. And that's, that's the technology that the optical uh, people are developing. And I think that's wonderful. And so I look forward to them succeeding on that part of it anyway. I think I have to politely uh, avoid this question. <laughs> yeah. Let me try to, to, to answer this question. Yeah, I, I'm going to skip it, right? So, so the good thing is like in the last year, I work on, on two different technologies. Let's say I look at a transmos or, or superconducting qubits, right? And I look at silicon spin qubits, right? I will tell like the first one on the transmos because yeah, it's more advanced in the number of qubits that allow us to develop, let's say this full system stack, right? And to play with software and all these intermediate layers. So I will take uh, as my second one or like the next one that is, I think it's promising is the, the, the one based on, on, on silicon spin qubits, right? 
maybe I'm a bit biased because yeah, I was collaborating with, with Intel for like the last years, right? But I saw all the progress on, the, on this technology in the, in, the, in the last year, right? Showing like better and better uh, gay fidelities. And and also like like now there are there are with like kind of not the same cubits but but a, a race of, of quantum dots, and it seems to be to be it seems to be very promising in terms of scalability, right? And also because yeah, we were able to to or to to manufacture this this uh, wafers with with billions of, of of transistors, right? And why not using the same kind of technology, just just billions of qubits? But yeah, I'm a bit biased, I guess, right? So. That's my bet. My, my fantasy is to see, and I'm not saying it's feasible, but to see all of the qubits together in a single computer uh, controlled by quantum machines. But, uh... That would be great, right? We see that. Yeah. You may have been on airplanes too much. <laughs> OK, let's. Um, uh, skip ahead to question six what is the role of and, and challenges of software within the control layer of the stack how important is it in scaling up to hundreds and thousands of qubits yeah i think actually i already commented on this but i mean the software is probably more important than the than the hardware itself um you know that's uh i i believe the um Quantum machines and other hardware manufacturers can figure out how to how to scale of their systems. Getting to a million is is uh, unknown exactly how we do that, but they're certainly going to be able to scale far beyond what we have today, while keeping an eye on the cost and, and making it affordable and and realistic. I mean, if your qubits cost a thousand dollars per qubit in terms of the qubit and the control, that's not scalable either. So that is very important. But it's really the software and the usability and the uh, possibility of building intelligence into those software systems it's going to be crucial yeah i actually really agree with that and we are now doing a lot of work in, in software and i think that yeah because first of all I, I agree productivity of development i think is is key um there's just so much more to do um to build a full scale or large scale quantum computer that we just need to have System, so we need to have productivity and we need to have performance, and there are bottlenecks in both in software, of course. And so I think one key area in the software that's going to be important is is modularity, um, because and that proved itself, you know, um, in software in general, not related to quantum, that you really need to be able to develop in a modular way and scalable way. Um, and then the other thing that I think is going to be important is is the the integration between the software and the hardware. Um, so just an example, if you want to run a, a, a sophisticated calibration uh, workflow on 100 qubit device or 1000 qubit device, of course, you want to parallelize a lot of things. You want to uh, be able to uh, pre-compile a lot of the programs, but then override some of their parameters just before running them. So things of that nature. So you have to have this productivity from the software. It has to be done in an easy way. And again, modular way, because each calibration is a different module and, and you want to develop it independently. And then you want to tie them all together. For example, I'm talking about calibrations, but applications is going to be the same, I believe, uh, especially in the NISC era. Um, and then um, and then you want to run it efficiently. So you want to parallelize as much as you can. You want to uh, pre-compile as much as you can. You want to do all these things and you want to tie them in, in a tight way to the hardware. So, you know, uh, tying the, the software and the hardware in, in the right way uh, while having uh, productive user interfaces and, and programming tools, I think is, is, is key. Yeah. I guess, um, I mean, the cliche is that software is eating the world. Um, it's I like ninety percent of our f like at Google, software outweighs everything else by a lot. Um, it's <clears throat> so from the control system. I guess one thing that we are looking for going like is. Uh, uh allow 
uh, designing the lower levels in a way that allows us to manage the software complexity at the higher levels. Um, so uh, a thing that has sort of come uh, flipped around in my mind is it used to be when you were like designing some electronics, uh, you would say uh, you were really excited that now that we have like microcontrollers and microprocessors, I can avoid making decisions when I design a circuit board and then just push that complexity into software and software is faster developed, easier to debug, quicker to change. Uh, and that's great. Um, but now managing software complexity is the biggest task in almost any organization. So designing the system so that it provides um, good abstraction layers so that we can manage that complexity is, um, I think, critically important. Um, even if you make the hardware more complex for something that you could do in software. Um, uh, so I think that's a, a bit of a change in perspective I've had in the last few years, and uh, I think I'm not the only one. So, yeah, so indeed, I mean, that maybe we should also make a difference between, let's say, I don't know how to call it exactly, but high-level software or compilation techniques, right? Something that you do offline, right? And, and runtime, uh, let's say, control uh, software, right? That is, is, is something different. So something that I learned also in the, in the last years, uh, uh, working together with, with the physicists, uh, running the experiments, like whenever, at the beginning, whenever they couldn't do something that they, let's put it in software, right? Or in the, in the compiler and say, right, that increases a lot of the complexity, we cannot solve any problem there, right? So I think that indeed, I mean, one of the most difficult part here, and, and as the complexity increases, right, and the number of qubits and so on, it's where to place where, right? There would, some, there would be some things that can be indeed like, like, like put in the, in the more high level software in the compiler, and you do that uh, 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 in a static way, and there will things that will require that, like runtimes so support, right? And uh, things that that in, in low level, let's say, software, something that we need, and that's something that was mentioned before in one of the technical sessions on 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 the quantum system track. That I think it was uh, it was I think no, I'm sure it was a talk from Leon Riesebos. I think he is sitting there in the first row, right? Hi, Leon. Well, thank to see you. So yeah, so he mentioned like like several several let's say properties that the the low level control software should, should have that's uh, the, that are flexibility, right, and and portability between systems. And I guess that indeed those are uh, uh, the main let's say. Uh, one of the main, let's, uh, let's say, uh, properties of, of this low-level control software. Uh, we have a few minutes here. I thought maybe we would open up to some audience questions, if there are any of those. So if you would come up to the mic up here and ask your question, that'd be great. Hi. Uh, uh, I'm. My name is Jonathan Wirtz from Quera. Um, so I, I understand the, the, the title of this section is 1,000 qubits. Um, but uh, my, my question is, do you think that the, these same solutions will scale up to our eventual million qubit machine, or will this require a whole new set of, of solutions for much larger scale? So I, I think that a I think it's a very good question because I think that a thousand qubits and, and a million qubits is, is a completely different thing. Um, for example, I think that up to a thousand qubits, we could parallelize all the control, right? I mean, just brute force, and it makes sense to do it because, again, we just need to squeeze as much as, as possible, squeeze performance of the QPU, shorten the circuit time as much as possible. But with a million qubits, I think that that becomes, you know, okay, well, then the control cannot scale linearly with the, with the number of qubits, so we have to start doing something else. And that is why I think actually that we have to choose a number, okay, whether it's 20, whether it's 100, whether it's 200, whether it's maybe a thousand, but focus on, you know, at some point, we really have to bring everything to, to, to that it, it works, it really works. And then we can, we can not just reach scale, but reach scalability. And that, that is, I think, going, so at some number we have to, uh, you know, focus, say, this is the number, we do that. And then from there, we can build scalability, not just scale. Uh, that's Yeah, I, I would very much agree with what Jonathan said. Um, 
you know, I wouldn't pretend to be able to really design a million qubit system today. And I don't think we get there by pretending we, we can do that. We have to choose some number, maybe it's a hundred, maybe it's a thousand, maybe it's even a couple thousand, but, let, but let's build a system at that scale. And even though the solution at a million will be very different in a number of ways, uh, the lessons learned at that smaller scale will be invaluable. So we, we have to go through that process in my opinion. I'll add one thing to that at least, which is that, um, you know, we've, we've made uh, now a, a roughly hundred qubit processors, but it's not like we don't have 20 qubit processors anymore uh, at Google um, because there's some things that you don't need more than that for some things. Maybe you actually only need a few, a few, uh, qubits for. So uh, I think even when we have a million qubit quantum computer, there's going to be use, at least in research and development, for thousand qubit systems to test out new forms of error correction and improve materials and different chip interconnects and so forth before, because Whenever you're building the largest system you know how to build, it's very expensive uh, and very time consuming and takes up a lot of your team's resources. So I think to some extent, um, we're probably always going to have 10 qubit systems and we're probably always gonna have thousand qubit systems uh, even when we move beyond that. So I think it makes sense to, to have a control system for those intermediate things because the the control system that we designed for a million qubits might also not scale down very well to a research environment working on a few dozen qubits obviously that depends on how it looks but um you know if there's extensive uh multiplexing or like um limited control options because we know we can get away with that uh we're still going to want the general purpose um uh thing for smaller chips uh hi my name is Vitz Vetas. um my background is uh semiconductor uh test equipment so we build large-scale systems for testing many many things in the, especially in the mixed signal area so uh in our world the costs you know, the main cost as speeds go up is the converters, right? As, and I know you're using some really, you know, pretty powerful 16 bit high speed converters to generate your, your signals and all that. But the question is, is that overkill? And at some point, you know, every bit that you squeeze down is gonna cut your cost down. Also the data path goes down and do you really need it, right? Maybe you can try some of those experiments now in the short term by just truncating the bits and seeing what happens. Yeah, I'll say something and then I think I'll let Evan because I think Google actually has done some work on that, uh, if I'm not mistaken. But uh, I think for us, it's actually a very interesting question because we we need to, okay, we have uh, we have what we think and we have what the customers think, yeah? Um, so physicists want 16 bits, <laughs> so we should give them 16 bits. But I, I totally agree. That, I mean, so you can take a DAC that has less yeah, the number of bits is, is much lower, and, and I think you can reach uh, good good fidelities. Um, but okay, there there are reasons to go to to higher number of bits. I mean, there are a lot of reasons. So um, I think it's it's too detailed of a discussion to to do right now. But but I think I think it's a good question to bring up because again, especially if you want to scale up systems, we have to decide what we're giving up on and what we're what 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 stays with us, and so. We will have to make trade-offs, so we cannot get everything, you know. Um, so the engineers understand it very well. Physicists a bit less. <laughs> so, um, but and, and and understanding what are the real trade-offs and what are the real bottlenecks towards scaling up. Um, that is, I think, the first thing to do. And then, yeah, I mean, I think uh, maybe just a quick comment on that. I mean, you're absolutely correct. It would be wrong to spend more than needed on performance that's not necessary. But in an R&D environment where there's 20 different things we're worried about, if I can take some of them out of the picture and not have to think about it, 
I'll, I'll pay for a few extra bits so I don't have to worry about that aspect. Yeah, actually, and I think, yeah, I think over designing at this stage is not, is not too bad. Yeah, again, I mean, okay. We'll, we'll talk more about when you are scaling. Yeah, when we are scaling, yes, yeah. So, yeah, so um, as, as Jonathan said, I have some, we, we've done some work on this at Google. And um, so first of all, I'll say to do like a, a Pi Pulse, um, it probably depends on your system, but roughly you need like 10 or 11 bit DAX uh, is really enough in most systems. And you can just get that back from like the amplitude theorem for Pi Pulses. Um, and we've done simulations of that and it comes out to be uh, 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 more or less correct. Uh, but our qubits have, um, for instance, our frequency tunable and we tune them by the DC bias and we need more resolution for the DC bias than we need for the microwave pulse. So we use the same converter for everything. Uh, it's overkill for some of the control systems, but not for others. But we would totally imagine when you make a system for, uh, for uh, thousands or millions of qubits that you could use different optimized channels for different control signals. Um, or you could imagine using a combination of like a 12-bit DAC, high-speed DAC, RF DAC, and a, um, uh, a DC DAC to set your operating point that had higher resolution. These are all things that you definitely can do. They add complexity to your system. They add more things to worry about. And then uh, very piggybacking off of what uh, Mark said, um, yeah, maybe you need need 11 bits of dyna uh, pulse amplitude accuracy. But the way you wired your system up today, one line has an uh, uh, the optimal pi pulse amplitude is 5% of full scale. That's something that happens when you're doing research systems. And if you were doing that and you had a, a 11 bit DAC, you would have to like, in our case, warm up the cryostat, go find what control line is wrong and fix it so that your dynamic range is perfectly matched all the way from the DAC down to the qubit. Whereas if you paid a few bucks extra for the DAC, uh, you've got a lot more wiggle room to screw up somewhere else in between while you're uh, practicing this. So we, we definitely see opportunities for uh, you know, engineering optimizing those systems, but uh, right now uh, doing the uniform thing and giving us uh, some, some wiggle room is preferable. So there's an interesting question in the chat here. Um, and I, um, so what from David Ding, what theoretical quantum computing questions do you think would be most relevant and helpful for mitigating the scalability challenges for control? And I'm given that we're close to out of time here, I'm going to say if anybody has a great answer, um, I let's do that. But um, otherwise, maybe we think of this as, uh, you know, um, an exercise for the reader after the, after the time. I, Go ahead, Evan. Uh, if there was a system for passive error mitigation uh, that we could use as a first level of error correction, that would make a tremendous difference. Yeah, or I was going to say um, invent an error correcting code that has an extremely high threshold and doesn't need many ancillas and uh, that will reduce requirements. Great, thank you. All right, so let's, uh, let's go to our last question. Um, how would you define the ideal next gen quantum controller? And maybe, maybe just call out an an aspect or two of it rather than obviously this is a complex system and would have a lot of attributes but if you just see you know a couple of things that you think would be uh essential to to a next gen controller Jonathan you want to go first I just I don't the answer but I, I I cannot tell you because it's what we're working on uh, um 
yeah i mean i think that you again in my mind it's uh yeah we want to scale up the number of channels we want to improve analog performance we want to uh we want to do all that but i think ultimately the two things that are important are um going forward are the uh the the the, the software scalability the software the, the the way you program the productivity of the of the software and the modularity of the software and then tying that to uh the real-time capabilities and the execution model of the hardware so that means the classical processing that can run in real time and how you would take advantage of it from the higher level software um, and the execution model again like how would you um, how do you be able to uh, to efficiently run workflows um, by parallelizing uh, modules of software and 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 uh, pre-compiling programs? Um, yeah, so it's the software uh, productivity in the software and the real-time capabilities and execution model of the hardware. That 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 that's ultimately what we are working on and what I think are the most important things. I'll just say provide a um, agile, high performance, real time capable control system that does not require the scientists and engineers I work with to learn a new programming language. I, I would say the the integration with quantum error correction is the the most uh, important feature of the next the next generation, not maybe the next next gen controller um yeah so yeah from my side i will i will mention something that was already mentioned right it is of course scalability and that relates to something to be modular right and fully addressable the other thing is like, I would say, smart of intelligent. That means that things are not kind of hard coded sometimes, but autonomous decision making, let's put it in that way, or even self healing, right? And then some kind of, of, of more resources. So, of course, we want to be low power, low latency, and, and compact in case of, of size, right? So, that will be the main, say, properties or ideal next generation of quantum controllers. Thank you. So, uh, if um... If I could, uh, if I I'd ask us to thank our panel members, uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you for uh, keeping us on the straight and narrow, both of you. Um, and with that, we will close. Thank you. <laughs>